speaking for a few minutes from the subject, the lady in waiting. The lady in waiting. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And if I should leave a subtopic, it would be she got her blessing. Amen. She got her blessing. We have been hearing about pressing into the blessing all week long. This message tells a story or paints a picture of two women who waited on the Lord and received their blessing. Naomi and Ruth were mother and daughters-in-law. Ruth was the widowed wife of Naomi's oldest son, Marlon, who died while they were uh, in Moab. They had a unique relationship in that Ruth forsook her mother, her family, her nation, and their gods to go with Naomi to her homeland of Bethlehem, Judah. She told her in uh, chapter 1, verse 16, reading in part, For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. For Ruth, it was no more worshiping the small god Chemosh, Baal, or any of the other gods that the Moabites worshiped. For the Lord God Jehovah became her God. And the land of Bethlehem, the promised land that God had given to his chosen people, became her permanent place of residency. When they got to Bethlehem, Judah, they had nothing. They lived as destitute immigrants. Ruth worked in the fields from sunup to sundown as a gleaner to get food for Naomi and her to eat. Obviously, Naomi's husband had sold or forfeited the family's inheritance when they moved to Moab. But now that she and her son's wife were back, they were desperately in need of a kinsman redeemer. Somebody who could, somebody who could and would pay the price to buy back their property and marry Ruth. The amazing thing about God is that he had the man already prepared and in place by the time they got to Bethlehem, Judah. When Naomi was in Moab, God allowed her to hear something. According to verse 1, 6b, it says that she heard that the Lord had visited Bethlehem in giving them bread. She heard something, and it woke up her faith. It stirred up her spirit and caused her to get up and do something about her situation. Even though she was in a low place, life had beaten her down. Her husbands and sons were all dead, leaving her bitter of soul. But when she heard something that caused her to get up and do something about her situation. Amen. And you know, we hear a lot in, in the church today about women being broken and women that are hurting. And I want to say that if you're broken and hurting, get your broke and hurt self up and do something about your situation. Amen. If Naomi could get up and do something about her life and about her situation in bitterness of soul, you can get up and do something about your situation. The last verse of chapter 1, verse 22, tells us that they left Moab and came to Bethlehem, Judah. Then chapter 2 Verse 1 says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So by the time they left, in the last verse of chapter 1, 
and they arrived in Mo in uh, Bethlehem in the first verse of chapter 2 is telling us before they tell her story before they talk about the situations that they endured in Bethlehem Judah they tell us about the man that was already there in place ready able willing and prepared to do what they needed him to do. Although the author lets us see in, two, in chapter 2, verse 1, that the man was already in place, Naomi and Ruth didn't realize at the time that the man was in place. You see, the Lord let us peep in and see what was going on before he told the story. They left Moab in a desperate situation. Naomi tried to convince Orpah and Ruth to go back to their own mother's house. You know, she told them, you know, you go back to your own mother's house and the Lord be with you. Uh, because, you know, at that time, the only hope, the only prospect that Naomi could see when she decided to leave Moab, uh, the only hope that she had for the future was that she got pregnant and had another son. And then that son was supposed to get old enough for, uh, for them to marry. And they were supposed to sit there and wait until the son got old enough to marry. And of course, uh, Naomi had sense enough to know that that was not going to be uh, 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 an obvious prospect. <laughs> so she told them to go home. Go back to your mama's house, honey, because I can't help you no more. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Although chapter 2, we see all throughout, chapter, all throughout chapter 2, we see how Moab was strategically positioned in the right place at the right time. When, when she needed someone to let her glean in his field, Boaz was there. When she needed protection from the men in the field, Boaz was there. When she needed more provisions, Boaz was there. As a foreigner who looked different and needed to see a friendly face with a kind word, Boaz was there. And when she needed a kinsman redeemer to buy back their property, Boaz was there. It is clear that as God was prompting Na Naomi, in Moab to get up and to go back home, he was also pro uh, prompting Boaz. He was also positioning Boaz to be in place. Then in chapter 3, Naomi senses that this is the right time to make their move. By now they have been in Bethlehem, Judah for a little while. Um, uh, they had come to know who Boaz was. When, uh, when, Naomi, when Ruth got back home and told Naomi about Boaz, she remembered who he was and remembered that he was a near kinsman. At the same time, she began to think about how Bethlehem Judah was now Ruth's permanent place of res residency and how she would not always be there with her. As an older, seasoned, mature woman, she sensed that Ruth, who was a foreigner in an unfriendly nation, needed to be established in this new place with this new people that she was coming to know. In her, in her view, in Naomi's view, now was the right time for them to make their move, to approach Boaz and request that he be their kinsman redeemer. So what did they do? They put together a plan. Naomi uh, became the advisor and began to tell her step by step what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to go, when to go. Praise the Lord. And then uh, in verse 11, the answer comes. They make, the, they make their approach. And Boaz says in verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requires. Boaz put her at ease and let her know, don't worry, I got it. But he also let her know that there's, it's going to be a process because there's somebody else involved. 
There's another man who is a nearer kinsman than I am. And in order to be proper, in order to be correct, we've got to approach him first. Give him the opportunity first before I can do this. And as flattered as he was at the opportunity to marry this beautiful young woman as an old man, he wasn't willing to do it. He wasn't willing to break the rules in order to do it. Praise God. He, fo he followed the established order. He did it the way it was supposed to be done. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I want you to know, saints, that when you're in a dilemma, do what is right. They were in a desperate situation, but they did it the right way. Don't allow desperate times to put you in a corner. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel that you have no other options. Because in Christ, you always have options. The thing about it is that you can't always see the options. You can't always think about the options like Naomi. When she was in Moab, she couldn't think about what was going to take place or the prospects that were waiting for her over in Bethlehem. God's got some options in place for you that you can't see right now. You've just got to believe and know that some way, somehow God is going to work it out. That God's got you in, in mind. That God, God's got you in view. And he's going to work it out for you. They followed the plan. They did, the, they did their job. They did their part. They did all that they could do. The plan that they put in place, they executed it. They were intentional about dotting the I's and meticulously crossing the T's. They did their part. Yes. And so Naomi told her, baby, now what you got to do is you've got to settle yourself and put it in your mind that you've got to wait. You got to wait and let this thing work out. You got to wait and see how God is going to cause this thing to pan out. And so what did she do? She waited. She set herself to wait. She waited. Praise the Lord. Amen. And then in verse, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then went Boaz. Uh, the, uh, the NIV says, meanwhile, Boaz went. In the meantime, while she was waiting, while she had positioned herself, that I'm just going to wait and allow this man to do what he said he was going to do. Praise the Lord. Boaz immediately got up on that morning and went to work and began to do what he promised her that he would do. He went to the city gate and sat there, waiting for that other man to pass by. And when he passed by, he told him all about what was going on and how Naomi was back in town and they needed a kinsman redeemer. And it, at first, he said, okay, I'll do this. But then when he thought about it and when, he, when they added in there that his uh, daughter and her daughter-in-law was with her and you got to marry her. So he said, no, I can't do all of that now. Cause <laughs> he said, I can't. Woo. He said, I can't do all of that because if, if I do all of that, that's going to mess up my own inheritance. So I can't mess myself up trying to help her. So that, you know, that just freed Boaz and just put him in place to be the kinsman redeemer. Praise the Lord. So he followed the law. Boaz went to the uh, city gate. He talked to the man. And then the next step was to get the elders of the city and have the elders of the city to come and to be eyewitnesses of what was taking place. He had to take off his shoes and, and do all of that and offer that to, uh, as a vow. They didn't have lawyers where you'd go to the courtroom and sign a paper. What you had to do was kick off your shoes as a vow that you were going to do what you said that you was going to do. And Boaz got up, took off them shoes, praise the Lord. He was ready. He was in place to do what she needed to have done. Praise the Lord. While all of this was going on, I can imagine that Ruth was anxiously sitting there 
wondering what's going on. Wondering how did he respond? Did he say yes? And see, with all of that, you know, thinking that the other man was going to do it and then he changed his mind, you know, it was kind of a hiccup in the situation. And sometimes while you're waiting on the Lord, hiccups happen. Things that you're not expecting happen. And while we're sitting there wondering why it's taking so long, God is busy taking that situation that should have worked out, that didn't work out, trying to make that thing work out together with all the other things that are in place so that it will work out together for your good. That's why it's taking so long. It's working for your good. God is working things out for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And sometimes we're wondering why. Why can't I hear from God? Why is nothing being said from the Lord? Sometimes God is just busy working it out on your behalf. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that I know the thoughts that I have of you, saith the Lord. God has an image in his mind about you. There's something that God has on his mind that he wants for you. And God is trying to get you to that place that he has in his mind for your life. While you're busy pouting, wondering why God is not working. While you're upset, wondering when Boaz is going to knock on your door. God is somewhere working on your behalf. Hallelujah. Instead of pouting, why don't you tell the Lord, I don't see you moving, but I know that you're moving. I don't feel your presence, but I know you're there, moving and working on my behalf. Hallelujah. Some way, somehow, the Lord will work it out for you. Amen. Did I hear somebody say that they've been waiting on a blessing? Did I hear you say that you're waiting on God to do that thing for you? But I want to tell you to hang on in there. God is going to work it out for you. Hang on in there. God's got you on his mind. God is working on your behalf. Hallelujah. He's on your job working. I know that boss is mean as the devil, but even while they're mean, God is working. God is working on him. Don't worry about what you see. Just know that God is working. Amen. You must keep the relentless determination that Ruth had. That it's going, you got to have that assurance that some way, somehow, God is going to work this thing out for you. And as I go ahead on and close this thing, can I tell you that just as Boaz was their kinsman redeemer, we have a true kinsman redeemer. They call his name Jesus. And I want you to know that one day when we were bound by sin and shame, God sent his son to be our redeemer. He brought us back from the clinches of the devil. He brought us back. He he redeemed us. Has anybody been redeemed? I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. And just like Boaz was working it out for Ruth and Naomi, our God, our kinsman redeemer, is working it out on our our behalf. He's in that situation. You can't see it, but you got to know that he's in that situation. Hallelujah. So wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. And I want you to know that now is the right time for you to make your petition before the Lord. Our Redeemer is here to grant your petition and to meet your need. He's able. Not only is he willing, not only is he able, but he's willing and he will pay the price for us and do that thing that we need. 
to have done. Praise the Lord. Clap your hands for Jesus and give God the highest praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.